Hello, it's Derek. Do you see my shirt? Check it out. I have to admit, I watched Hayden Pickering's talk at State of the Browser, and I was like, I gotta have that shirt right now. And it was actually really hard to find. I'll leave a link uh, to it. I don't, you know, it's, I'm not an affiliate or anything. I just think if you're gonna wear a stupid t-shirt, it might as well be this one. So I found this video, or I remembered I had this video. It was, It's on our blog. It's on the Perpetual Education Vimeo thing, but I forget we don't ever really put anything on YouTube because we don't we don't care about it. <laughs> it's not our goal, but uh, it seems like you people should see it. That's the whole point that we made it to begin with. Uh, so anyway, I thought I'd give it a little intro. I'm Derek, some scam artist, huckster, asshole on the internet who's trying to trick you, uh, or <laughs> just like who loves talking about programming and development and wants to make friends <laughs> and wants you to be. Um, uh, you know, maybe talk about programming with me or something. Anyway, so I made this video and I was half awake and it's about the Odin Project. And I just want to say I have a lot of respect for the people who make the Odin Project and open source projects everywhere. With that said, I'm just being critical and I think that I expect, I would, I want people to be critical of me and I want to, uh, I want to have an actual discussion. And I think that there are some things that could be better and I'm pointing them out. And if you're not the type of person who likes that stuff and it's gonna make you cry, get the fuck out of here and don't watch this video. But if you'd like to spend an hour or however long this dang thing is and, and learn about how I think about CSS and maybe learn some stuff that will change your life uh, then you should watch it. Otherwise, maybe it's the worst and then just go write how horrible I am down below because I can handle it. Um, I'm begging for it. I went to school for art and there was barely no critical thinking. Anytime I said anything, people cried. It was pretty boring uh, as far as the actual conversation. And I'd like to have that with you. So here's my stupid video. Watch it or don't. <laughs> Hello, it's Derek from Perpetual Education. I'm at home today. So, I don't know why, I just woke up from this like fever dream because it was so hot and I was searching around on the internet and I ran into a whole bunch of posts about the Odin Project and it made me think, man, I have been kind of wanting to talk about this and maybe now's the time, I don't know. But you don't really need to see my face for this video, do you? I don't have the, the best light around here and I don't have my fancy camera or anything. Okay, but maybe, maybe, maybe I'll just edit my face out of it. So I was looking around, I saw a bunch of posts saying, wow, free code camp, their CSS and HTML is so good. Wow, the Odin, I put them together and I made this project and I, I was just thinking, okay, well, interesting. All right, well, let's look at it. Let's look at the code. And so you can see the code and both of these companies are great in theory, right? There are these free schools, these free online schools. They both have different teaching styles. Odin's mostly text-based. Free Code Camp has some interactivity, but it's also very text-based. Then they build up community efforts. They have people making videos about it. They link out to other videos, stuff like that. They have a Discord. They have a whole forum and all sorts of stuff. So it's like a whole huge community. Some people just love it. I also know though that like hundreds of thousands of people probably waste hundreds of hundreds and thousands of hours doing it and they don't learn well because well underneath there it's not that great they don't teach you the stuff that I would teach you not <laughs> uh, not not just me personally but I mean like stuff that you actually use out in the industry the, all of the little tricks and the history and how they all fit together, you know, making a web page that doesn't break, I think should be part of building a foundation. And almost every project I see from people who've been following Free Code Camp or Odin, it's like there's no they're like, "Oh yeah, it'll be it's it's a desktop only. It doesn't work on a phone." Uh, it, yeah, I didn't do that. I, maybe I'll do that one day. And so they're just making these big broken things. I'm going to show you some examples uh, in just a second. So anyway, this isn't just to trash talk Odin or free code camp. But what I want to do today is go through one of the lessons and go and make this like landing page thing to show you how to do it because they're not showing you how to do it. And I want to contrast how, like, why is it being written? You know, like it's 2009 
when it's 2021. You'll have to forgive the sound at this location. I don't have much control over it. Okay, the Odin Project, foundations. Let's see, starting foundations. Like I said, it's mostly text-based. And if you come in here, it's gonna tell you a bunch of stuff, how the course works, introduction to web development, mindset. There's lots of good stuff in here. Let's see, uh, they want you to learn Git right away, which I understand their reasoning for that, but I also think that learning Git and NPM and stuff like that early in your process, it's just it's not how I would do it. So introduction to HTML and CSS, let's just look at that really quickly. Um, do, do, do. So, so they all link to each other. It's, it's like they're articles that collect other resources. Like for example, this is linking to Free Code Camp. Free Code Camp links to this. Also, this is interesting. Everyone on Reddit is like, Odin, Odin, it's free. Why would you ever do anything else? But then Odin itself is advertising for Thinkful, one of the shittier boot camps. So it's a great place to get stuck and then eventually go to a shitty boot camp. CSS foundations, the box model. Okay, some of these things are pretty confusing if you ask me. Introduction to Flexbox. Down here, there are some various code pens and things, but for the most part it's text. And it has sort of a, an interesting attitude. It'll say things like, the most confusing thing about Flexbox is it is blah blah blah. Well, that seems very personal to whoever wrote this, and I don't think that's a way to start off explaining something to somebody. Also, they do things like, here's a flex container, but they don't even set it to display flex. So, flex direction column actually wouldn't do anything, and that's, to me, leading people down the wrong road here. Okay, so it's telling you some stuff, lots of articles, knowledge check, okay, thinkful advertisement. And here, at the end of this Flexbox area, is the project, landing page project. At this point, you should have learned proper HTML, you should have learned you know, responsive design thinking, how to lay out pages, how to break things up into modules, how, how to use Flexbox to, to you know, make the page flexible and, and get all the layout nice and smooth. It says, do not be afraid to use Google and go back to the lessons and real life professional uh, look things up on Google all the time. That is true, but we look up things with the knowledge of what we need to look up. Like, oh, I, I want to put this thing to the right, so just blindly looking up how do I make CSS work uh, isn't gonna help you. But if you know where to look, then it's great. But I feel like this whole, well, we wrote the article, you should be able to find it out yourself. That's sort of the mentality of the people at Odin. They, if you should be able to learn it yourself, basically. And here is a helpful guide or what they consider like a great framework to help you. And it, I think it is a really great framework for the right people. I just don't think most of the people out there are that person. And let me clarify what I mean by that. I don't think it's very good at teaching HTML and CSS. I don't think anyone is very good at it for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, but I think that if you are the right type of person, you are the type of person who'd probably be able to learn on your own anyway, and you go through the more advanced stuff that they do, not the foundations course, I think it can be a, a really good program for the right people. Okay, how to set up your GitHub repository. Okay, you can come to the Discord server and ask for help. I saw a page on here somewhere that just links to Kevin's CSS pages. Just like, like go watch a bunch of YouTube videos. That's, that's what you should do. Ah, here it is. They're teaching you about images. They don't teach you about the picture element or figure element or anything. And I don't know how this <laughs> the image is all breaking the page. That's not a good way to teach teach about the images. And then down here, uh, well, it's tech, teaching technique is just go look at Kevin's videos about images. You know, Kevin Powell. What would web design look like? So it's free, but now here I'm getting sold on uh, web from the future of the tools. terrible. Hi, and welcome to the next part of my series on HTML and CSS. So it's free, except that it's really Kevin's work that is being, <laughs> that's being put here. The whole idea that everything's free, but then we're just leveraging each other's work is very interesting. This content could be considered free, but it's actually like Kevin works for Google for just really low wages selling uh, advertising. Say no to corporations. It isn't so much a clarified teaching method 
it's a repository of stuff kind of put in order in a way that could or could not help you. So anyway, here's the assignment. Download this, this image, which is a layout. I think this is a fine project. They don't tell you what to do on a small screen or anything like that, but this isn't so terribly unreal world. And then they give you some colors and some fonts. It seems like a fun project. Here are their suggestions. There's many ways to tackle the project. It could be done, it could be overwhelming to start with a blank page, take one section at a time. Website has four main sections. That seems pretty smart. Uh, for the section you're working on, get the content on the page, do the HTML and stuff before you do the CSS. Okay, do, 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 do. Many of the elements in the page are very similar things to you saw in the, in the Flexbox exercises. Okay, well, I didn't do those, but. Do not worry about making your project look nice on a mobile device. We'll learn that later. I have no idea why you would want to specifically be teaching someone how to do HTML and CSS layout and, and then teach them to do it in a way that is not compatible with the phone. It just is stupid. And what worries me more than that is I can actually go look at everybody's code here. So nothing personal to you guys. I'm making this video for people like you so that you can learn how to do it properly. Let's see. Page broken. Page not so broken, but clearly not working out very well. Broken. Broken. There's, there's just no reason to ever make a website that doesn't work on a small screen. And so, you know, what's going on here? What is going on here? This is this is bad. This is horrible. This why are they doing this to you? Why are they teaching you how to make terrible things? But it's free. I think they just don't know how to teach it very well. That's one thing. And then beyond that, if you want to get really cynical, it's a great way to get you set up to need something like Thinkful. But the problem is that Thinkful can't teach you this either. Here's one that's pretty good. Good job, you. The images are stretched though. It's unfortunate that people spend tons and tons of time uh, in free code camp or going to a boot camp and they come out just not understanding how to deal with responsive images when they could be taught that in an hour or half an hour. We've got a header and some sections and a nav. At least there's some, some markup that's proper. None of the other examples use the proper HTML elements. So from my limited research, one out of eight or nine people does a pretty decent job. Eight out of nine people are creating terrible HTML and terrible CSS. All right, Derek, you're such a jerk. Why are you kicking people when they're down? Well, I'm not. I can just hear the people on Reddit and in the comments. <laughs> I'll leave the comments open on this if I put it on YouTube. It's just, he's trying to sell something. He's, why, you know, who, how do you know what <laughs> anything? He's a know? witch! <laughs> what, well, who says what? It's uh, not what, fair. Uh, oh, eh, learn it. You can learn it yourself. Eh, you think, read the yeah. docs. Eh, I learned it myself. It only took me six years of staying up all night. Well, well, boot, my boot camp's the best. No, do not it learn it. Way. Learning by yourself. <laughs> so if you're one of those people, just consider maybe stop complaining all the time and whining and having so much opinions and just do something you know i'll be your friend if you if you want a friend you can come hang out on the css discord we could talk about things that are great instead of just talking about how everything's not how everything's too expensive and uh you know i don't want to buy a 99 cent app <laughs>
looking at a completed code is like learning how to make pizza dough from looking at a baked pizza. Well, that is not true at all. <laughs> it says there's a lot more that goes into it than you would have assumed only by seeing the final product and not the process. Well, if I could see the molecular structure of dough, I guess I could somehow figure out how to make dough. That is just not true. I doubt there is a human alive who without knowledge of cooking and the history of dough could look at a piece of pizza and somehow reverse engineer it. What a jerk. Why does he have to say it like that? Hey, and if I'm wrong, just tell me all about it in the comments. Okay, here is one image. I'm gonna right click and open in a new tab. But really, do I want it in a tab? I might just take a screenshot of it. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. And then the colors, I really don't care about these colors. I'm not, that's not interesting to me. Now some people would just jump right into the code. I am definitely not gonna do that. I will just open this thing in, I don't know, how about Sketch? Okay, here is the project. I need to look it over and just kind of think about it. There's this centeredness of it all, but I can't really create a situation like this. I could with CSS Grid, but we're not gonna use that for this project today. So that's not really gonna work. So instead, I could break it down into some smaller pieces. I can tell that there's this header and there's this sort of welcome zone and I don't know, some list of shit right here. Some centered, uh, I mean, at least this could be good looking or something. Okay, and then I got a little footer with some centered text, a little call to action, a quote. So here are a bunch of things. That's, that's interesting to consider. Um, then bigger picture, there's usually Let's just imagine that there is a header and a footer. Pretty, these are that's what the HTML5 elements header and footer are for, supposedly. Okay, and then there's this main area, and some of these are pretty debatable. I don't think that anyone who's really honest could say that these are cut and dry. I, I wouldn't trust someone like that. So it's a little confusing if you look at the spec, which I'm not gonna do in this video. Okay, so I've got header, main, this this could be these could be articles or they could be sections. There's there's some there's some gray area there. Okay, but I'm gonna just go with sections today and we, we can have a conversation and debate it in a in the CSS Discord or on a phone call. Who knows what you wanna do. All right, so these are some sections, but the thing that the visual designers do is they just give you this document and they don't really clarify, like they, these people didn't do that either. So I would imagine that each of these sections actually keeps going, right? You're gonna span the whole page. Um, then inside of them somehow you're gonna need to constrain the, the size I guess like this inner column so maybe I'll get a different color to help us explain that okay how about orange all right so instead of having an inner column type of thing that goes site wide like we did in the 90s um, maybe we'll do it in each section that has worked well for me it's different for different situations if you're making some kind of scroll jacked specialty marketing website you might do it differently okay so I've got all these sections great and Yes, I would think the same thing for these would also be. I'm just trying to see what the the patterns are here. This is a pretty common pattern. 
So I've got all these different sections and then they have these width constraints. So these are going to be orange. These are going to be my like column constraints. Depending if you use some kind of framework, which you should not use, uh, they're going to call them different things, rows, columns. But generally, they're just big slabs, like a big cake, a bunch of layers laying on top of each other, block level elements. Now, this is a foundations course, so I don't know how detailed it's fair to go, but I think that if you're going to be learning and, and thinking modularly, you might as well start now. So maybe I'll use a blue. I mean, I feel like this is probably a reusable component right there. I bet this is also a reusable component that is maybe used in other places on the website, maybe themed to a different color. I bet this is also a reusable component. I bet this is a reusable component. And uh, it's debatable whether this is, I mean, this footer is probably not reusable, but if we're going to do everything like this, maybe it's best to just think of this masthead and a site map at the bottom. So there's this whole structure that we're repeating here. Maybe there is a whole list of different things. Like we could switch out this module or switch out this module uh, depending on the page, right? Like this could be a bigger picture collection of modules that we're going to work through. And then from there, then the modules can be scoped. Um, and okay, so you could think about this area inside the module. This is some little grouping of text. This is an image. Um, down here, you have this kind of header, but then you just have a list. Um, and this card itself is a module, or you know, whatever you want to call it, a component. It's a little reusable thingy. And then, I don't know, this is a quote. This is the whole source. Here's some text here. Here's a button. So breaking these things down over here, there's a nav, and you know this is debatable what this is. Is it an image? It's, I mean, it's probably a link that goes home. Is pretty standard. There's some kind of legal thing floating around in the middle. So this is looking pretty good to me. I could build out this structure. There's one more thing you'd want to think about, which is what if these things didn't exist and you needed to fill up the space? So there's something called the sticky footer or however you want to think about it where we're on a short 404 page or something some kind of page that doesn't actually have this much content you'll need to keep this footer down at the bottom so that is something we will consider and has to do with this whole main section and we'll look at a resource about that so instead of looking at and and okay well while we're here just let me do a couple more things is there something is there something going on with this text that we can pay attention to I mean right now this is classic the, all of the text is different sizes everywhere so <laughs> it's very real world but the text underneath these things is probably the same as down here and maybe the same as up here and then there's a few different styles of headings and uh, different button text but but I'm not gonna get too specific with that I'm gonna show you how to just normalize that okay so instead of looking at the original I'm gonna look at this I can just open this up in preview I don't really need to see it very big really Really even need to see the code, a CSS, or HTML. I could just write this stuff. So in in CodePen, just for the record, there it, the body already exists. The body in HTML and the the header and stuff like that, or the head, rather. So you don't really need that stuff. But I'm just going to mark it here for you in case you're new, and just to help you be reminded. So I'm not going to deal with the metadata for this, although it's definitely important. Maybe I'll do it at the end. All right, so what's going on here? We've already got the body, so header and footer, right? We know about that. Then there is a 
main, main, main. What's inside the main? There is a section. Um, okay, and then inside of main, there's also another section. We could call these things something. How do I know all these HTML elements? Well, I was around in 2011 or whatever when they appeared, but people were using divs all the time and they were saying div was the element. It's a generic divider and a, a division of content. And they'd say div ID header, div ID footer, div ID main, div ID sidebar. And they did that so much that when they made HTML5, they, they did a whole scan of the internet and they were like, wow, everyone uses header, let's just make the header element. But you shouldn't be expected to just memorize these things. You can use the MDN, Mozilla Developer Network, HTML reference, it's a pretty great place. And you can click that here, I'll leave a link. And it's gonna have all of the different elements. Unfortunately, they do not really show you them in order of importance as a beginner. So you're gonna have to just dig through there and check it out and, and see. And you'll learn them one by one kind of in order of importance. Uh, yeah, so four sections, four main sections, all right. And a footer. And then in my CSS, I could create something. I'm gonna call this thing at the top, welcome. In the welcome area, just to keep things consistent, I'm gonna say border. Well, actually, I'm gonna do this on all sections. Section, that's an element. This is a, this is the selector. This whole thing is a rule. And then I'm going to create a property, which is border. And then, so that's the property. And this is the value for pixel solid lime maybe okay and I could just put some padding on here for now or I could say minimum height I don't know who cares 200 pixels something to give us something to look at so all the sections have this green border just like in my mock-up and then welcome I could say I don't know if it really matters about welcome there's a few bigger fish to fry there's a bunch of browser defaults called user agent styles. So if I create a heading, it's going to have some giant text, but I have it reset. So let me turn that off for a minute just to show you. So part of learning CSS is also learning how to set things up, reset things so that they don't cause you trouble. I don't want the browser telling me what to do. So resetting it, you can look up the Meyer reset and, and learn about it, but it basically takes everything and simplifies it and normalizes it so all the browsers in theory look the same and there aren't any weird styles that you did not decide on yourself. So I've got that set. But there's also another problem which is box sizing, sizing border box. And they talked about the box model in Odin. So if you've gone through Odin, uh, supposedly you should know that. You can look up Paul Irish, Paul Irish box sizing man I really spelled that one wrong huh I'll leave a note in here about that for you okay so that's out of the way that'll just make sure the padding stays inside the box instead of adding to the box's size and you should read about it I'm just gonna keep making some outlines here. Header would be border three pixel solid. I don't know what that is, red. Footer, this is a selector list. So multiple selectors with a comma. Got my footer and my header, cool. I could do this thing too if I want. It's just to help me see because, well, really, we need to fill out the content. All right, and I guess you just add the same thing to the main. Can you see how these two correlate? It's going pretty good. Next part is this orange thing, and you can call it whatever you want. You could say div, class, column, Except for me, I don't like calling it that because there's lots of columns throughout the website. And it's kind of confusing. Uh, you could say inner column. I don't know. 
I mean, <laughs> this is what I've used for a lot of my career. I've never been 100% happy with it, but that's how naming goes. It's kind of difficult. But these days, I actually just make a custom element because that's how I roll. Inner column. It's such a consistent pattern that why not? I don't know why any CSS experts would be watching this, but yes, I could use grid and I could skip the element of having an inner column, but there are some other reasons why I do it. And if you'd like to talk about it with me, I would love that. That would be super fun. So yes, there's lots of ways to do it. This is how I'm doing it in this video. I'm open to discussion. Inner column is a custom element and it comes into the world not really knowing about itself. So I'm going to specifically say display block because it doesn't really know. It, uh, the browsers, I think they just actually don't even give it a display, but it acts like it's display inline. Great. I have my little heading in there and my inner column, that's where I'm going to put the padding. Padding, let's just say 10 pixels. Okay, so given that, I will just pop this inner column inside of each of these sections and I'm just going to name them for fun. Welcome, that seems like a good name. Oh, sorry, this is flying around. Maybe I shouldn't have done this in CodePen. I'm just going to think about the names of these. Welcome area. The second part is a bunch of stuff. So maybe that's uh, products, list of crap. This one is a quote of some sort. This one is a call to action. And then down here, well, we have our footer. Now that I have some content in there, I can get rid of this min height stuff. Just let's see what we actually have going on here. How are you feeling about this? Do you want to stop and make this happen for yourself? Now, one of the big picture structure things uh, to do is, is this sticky footer I was telling you about. So you see how the footer is all up at the top of the screen. So there's a good trick for that. And let's see, who does that one? Philip, Philip Walton got a good trick. Sticky footer solved by Flexbox. Okay. So this page will explain it. Uh, I think it's slightly confusing because he uses the shorthand, but I'm going to paste it in here. Also, while I'm just structurally organizing, I'm going to say this is set up. This is some stuff that I need to set up site wide. And this, I'm going to call this area structure. And I'll leave you a little note about this. So the way that this works is we want to make these boxes flexible so we can tell them to do flexi, flexible, flex box things. The body is the big mama object here. I can say display flex. What's going to happen? It's going to go to this weird default row. So instead I can say text direction column, if I can spell it right, direction flex direction text direction what what is this guy doing making a mess flex direction column all right back to looking like a column great but what it does is allow each of these red boxes to have a new set of special properties because they're the direct children of this flex container now header footer and main are all flex items and they have some cool magic properties so one of them is I can set them to stretch. But what are they going to stretch to? 
for example, the body doesn't really know its own height. Let's see. Border 10 pixels. 10 pixels solid blue, just so you could see what's happening there. The body is stretching to fill its content. It doesn't actually know its height, which is great because it's supposed to be flexible. But if you want to give it a height, a new way to do that would be minimum height. You guys are so lucky. You get to have the best CSS ever. Minimum height, 100% viewport height. So that's great. Now it's at least, no matter what, going to fill up the page, which is really useful. And then from there, I can say with main, I can say flex grow one, which is true. And now it's going to that main area. Let me just make an extra clear border, 10 pixels solid pink or something. It's going to stretch this pink area down to fill the space. I can't explain all this stuff in this short video. I'm just, I'm just going in order of importance what you might need to know to build this extremely common layout. It, have you noticed? It's already responsive. Until you ruin it, it's responsive. You'll also need to note this. You'll need to have a meta viewport tag in there, a viewport meta tag. All right, awesome. Things are going pretty good. This is my structure. I'm just going to butt it up there so it knows that it has to do with the sticky footer. And my inner column is also very structural. I can get rid of some of these borders now that you've seen how it works. So if you'd like, you can take a moment to try it out for yourself. Alrighty, we have a lot of structure in place with very little code. Header, main, footer, okay. The footer and the header are things that probably are not going to be changing throughout the whole site. So this main is the actual page content that's going to be switched out based on the template or based on the routing and the, you know, the different page you're on, whatever the content is going to be, maybe coming from a content management system of some sort. Uh, but yeah, that's the part that's going to change. The header and the footer are, are going to be mainstays. We've got the sticky footer kind of thing worked out. So if there's a 404 page or some kind of short page that has no content on it, it's going to be, it's going to look nice and just have this consistency of footer being at the bottom. So where do you start? I mean, this is where I can agree with the Odin project in their suggestion to just take it section by section. I feel like I want to start with this welcome kind of area. And inside here, inside of this inner column, I'm not using PHP or any kind of templating system. So I'm just going to be writing the HTML here. But I feel like this blue line, this blue outline over here, this is like the module. These are the sections of the page, but this is this reusable module. And I'm going to call it, um, whoa, code pen. Don't kick me out now. No. Application error. Let's refresh. Heads up. Schedule maintenance tonight. Uh oh going into read only mode. Well, luckily for me, I could just go create this in some other place. Hey, I'm doc type regular HTML five. Okay. HTML head body. Drop all this stuff in here. Do you know how to do this stuff? Or do you just grab it from a boilerplate? All right, head, title, okay, Odin, uh, business man, template, up here, Lang, English, and you could run this through a validator or something and you could learn, oh, what am I missing? That type of stuff. Uh, in here, meta viewport, Tag, put that in there. All right, that's that's all I really care about for right now. I should probably put the char set to 
meta char set equals UTF eight. All right, and then I'll just make a note. Uh, meta should go here because that is a big deal, and they should be teaching you about metadata. Okay, so I got this going on, but then I also should probably do some kind of link to a style sheet, styles.css. Okay, and I'll have to make a styles.css. Maybe I can grab that from CodePen before it disappears. Set it so my styles are on the right, my HTML is on the left, which is cool, that's good. Gotta roll with the punches here. Now, since I don't have CodePen bringing in my reset, I could import it like this. I could say import, is it import or include? I think it's import. Mm, I could say Meyer reset.css. This is a good way to do it for now. And I could come out here. Well, let's just check and see what it looks like to start with. Open in browser. Now, since I don't have my reset, you can see this margin around the whole body and these different size of text, and I want to get that out of there. Meyer reset. Eric Meyer is this prominent guy who knows a lot about CSS, and he has this little snippet that you can grab that is a well-respected CSS reset. So check out Eric Meyer reset. Meyer reset. I could just call it reset, but I'm not gonna. Meyer reset. All right, that's imported. Let's just make sure that it works. Okay, we're back to normal here. Okay, back to where we were with the code pen. Things are good. This is probably even better for us to see what the heck's going down. This stuff isn't really meaningful. All right, you got setup. We've got structure, we've got some temporary borders and things down here. All right, where were we before we were interrupted? I was going to make this welcome module type of thing. And the way I see it, there are kind of two big chunks of content. And you'll get this with more practice, but I can imagine that the creative director, or the visual designer, or whoever, is probably gonna want this image to stack on top uh, for a phone and to have the text underneath it or vice versa. And then at a bigger screen, they're gonna get a little bigger and go next to each other. So pretty simple, two boxes. The boxes are on top of each other and then later they are next to each other. And inside here, this is probably the heading level one. And you know, it's got terrible line spacing, but we can work on that. So a couple different types of of text and basically just some boxes. And so because there's two boxes, I'm gonna call this a diptych of some sort. So I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a custom element. You could use a div or whatever you want, but that's not what I'm gonna do. Okay, so I'm gonna call this graphic diptych because that's kind of how I see it. It's a graphic diptych. It has a graphic in it and it's got two sides. Again, you could use a div. I'm just going to call it text content. That's one thing in there. There's a heading level one. This site is not that awesome. So I'm going to write next to it. It's pretty, pretty boring text. Okay. And then, uh, so I'm just making up that element. Remember? paragraph. Here is a paragraph text to support the welcome area stuff. All right, and then what else is in there? There's a little link. Okay, link and just thinking ahead. Often you have to do some special stuff with links. So maybe I'll put a span in there just to have an extra thing to work with. 
you know? No, don't do it. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. Nah, I won't do that for now. We'll see. I'll just say button text. Okay, so I don't even have to really look at what I'm doing. This is a box. It's got some text in it. Box, text in it. Nothing too genius here. Then next to it, there is a picture. And in a picture, I would put an image. And in my case, I just happen to have some go-to images. Doesn't look like much, but I have a heading and some paragraph and a button. Great, that's the actual HTML for this diptych thing. You can also see that my image is gigantic and is totally breaking the page. So it's a great time to talk about some of these details. The button text is blue. These don't have any special sizes to them anymore. So which should we tackle first? I think that site-wide, well, I don't know. I think the image, you know, the image is totally breaking everything. We should do that first. All right, and I consider that to be part of this site-wide setup. So first of all, one of the problems with that is picture is display inline by default. I don't know why, strange choice. Display block. Okay, so now it can act like a display block level element. That is helpful. Now the same thing is, uh, same sort of problem with image is it's display inline block by default because originally, historically, it was probably gonna be used inside of a paragraph, not like this. So I can update that, make it a little more modern. Display, display block, okay? And then I could say width 100%. So now it's gonna take up the width of its parent. And then because there can be different widths and heights on this HTML, I'm also going to make a note to say height auto. So now images will just be whatever their parent size is. And just to show you that, you know, gets out of hand a little bit sometimes, but it's never going to break the page, which is really important. So it's a great setting to to think about it like this as a setup and a default. Secret unlocked! The next sort of default thing we could work with is a link. Links are blue and they have underlines and a few goofy things about them uh, that are great as defaults. But in our case, this button is gonna look like something else for some reason uh, and, well, I don't want it to be blue. So I'm gonna say color inherit. Inherit is a cool value that means it's going to take on the color of its parent like it should, like, like all the other elements. So that'll be black because black is the default text for this area. Also, text decoration underline. I'll get rid of the underline text. If I could spell it right. Text, no, no underline, none, none underline. Great, but I do probably want links in my paragraphs, for example. I could create a link in here just to show you. Um, I do want my links to look like links. So next to that, I can also say any links inside a paragraph or inside of a list item or I don't know, who knows, even some headings or something. I could say color blue text decoration underline. So I'm getting the best of both worlds here. I'm getting the classic text or links and then I'm also, oh, that doesn't make sense. No, not H2s, links inside of these things. It's just something to consider. I'll just go with these list, list items and paragraphs. That's where I wanna have the classic looking blue link for now. So I have my reset up here, but then I also have my own setup, which I feel like is my personal reset for my company or for my project or whatever. And then I have my structure area here, and then I can have more of my styles down here. All right, great, you wanna let that soak in? I wanna check that out. onward. So right now, maybe I actually want to put the picture above the text. What do you think? I mean, it depends on what you're trying to do. But you might want to see the text first, you might want to see the picture first. 
if you just look at this, this is like a little mini website, a little mini project, graphic diptych. And I'm going to start styling it. Again, graphic diptych is something I just made up. Um, so I'm going to say components here. Let's say modules here. And graphic diptych is, is a custom element that doesn't know what display type it is. So I'm just going to call it display block. So nothing gets wacky. If I put a border around it, one pixel solid blue, looks great. But if I remove this display block, for example, you'll see weird stuff happens. See these little lines above and below? That's a sure indicator that there's something going on with the display type. Another cool thing you could do is up here, maybe in your setup, or maybe you have some kind of like developer styles. You could have, you could check everything in the body, say border, one pixel solid blue, padding, two pixels, and you could get a little setup here so you can you could toggle this on and off and, and, and see all of the squares so you don't get lost, especially when you're starting out when you're new. You can toggle that on, on and off when you need it. Okay, graphic diptych, that's cool. And then I can scope some of these things to graphic diptych, for example, text content. That also needs to be display block because it's a custom element. Uh, what about here? Don't use custom elements, no! I can't wait to read all those comments. All right, then picture. We can talk about it. Picture, which is already globally display block. So I've got my little, my little things. image first, that's there. At some point, I want these to be next to each other, right? That's the rule. That's what they said in the picture. It's gonna go next to each other. Image on the right, text on the left. So, I can make a little media rule. There's a few ways to do it, but this is the way I'm gonna do it. Media, minimum width, 700 pixels. And I could say graphic diptych. Display flex, like we did to the body earlier. Display flex, and I could say flex direction row. Let's see what happens. All right, now they're in a row, but the image is not second. So I could say row reverse which is pretty basic stuff so you should have learned that in Odin if they're teaching you the right things right okay that's one thing I could do I could also use grid there's lots of stuff I could do and within that uh, it looks like they're set 50% so I could say graphic diptych and I could use this cool new CSS thing called is I don't know if it's cool yet I can't decide but it makes it a little quicker to write. So I could say text, content, and then picture. Just a way to consolidate how to write this in a way. Instead of writing graphic diptych text content and then comma graphic diptych picture, this uh, makes it a little bit cleaner. At least that's how I'm understanding it so far. I think it has more benefits than I'm aware of. To help size them, I can say flex, basis, 50%, something like that. And then they'll try to be 50%. And then also, it's hard to see because there's a rag on the text, but these are all smashed up against next to each other. So what I can also do here is I can say gap 20 pixels and flex will just magically make a gap in there, which is a new development and it's very cool and exciting. Let's see how we're looking. Pretty close, pretty close, right? That's that's the stuff. Now, maybe just a little bit of uh, text styling. Checking back in, we've got our set reset, our setup, some dev styles, some structure. The next thing I might wanna think about is some typography. Maybe have a little section for that. 
typography B. Okay, and then this is what I like to do. I like to make things called voices loud. You can read my CSS tricks article on it if you like. Loud voice, and we'll just say font size 40 pixels, font weight 700, line height 1.1. Notice I used pixels for font size in this case, and I used font weight, no units, and I used line height, no units. That's just what I'm doing so far. Hey, this, this is just a description of how something could look. It's not being applied anywhere. So if I want to apply it, I could say class, give it a class with this attribute, and say loud voice. All right. Maybe a little smaller here. You know, there's a really little tiny website I have here. I should be at least 320-ish. Okay, so there we go. I got some size. Maybe that's a little too big for the phone. Just make some slight adjustments. These can always be tweaked later. Okay, so we got the loud voice, that's great. Now I'm gonna make one called calm voice. Oh no, it's not a mix in. Okay. This is probably closer to that. In this calm voice example, I'm gonna say one REM and let the person who's using the browser kind of decide based on their sizing. Okay, so calm voice. Again, this isn't applied to anything. So let me come down here and apply it. Calm voice. Okay, those are some things. And then a component, I would imagine, would be kind of like a button, something. Even though this is, this is a debatable territory, whether this link should look like a button, we're not going to talk about that today. Okay, background, color. Speaking of colors, maybe we should talk about colors. Color white, padding, 10 pixels, maybe 10 pixels on the top and the bottom, 20 pixels on the left and the right. But this, this is also something you could consider. You could say font size, 1.2 REM. And then you could do, if you wanted to, you could do some kind of M's here. Yeah, just for fun, in case you don't know about these. This is one place people like to use them. I think it's kind of silly. Okay, buttons, button. And then I could come down here and give this a class of button. Class, button. So I'm describing how I want things to look, and then I'm just going in here and describing the content by applying those descriptions to it. Does that sound does that sound confusing? <laughs> I'm outlining these desired visual treatments and then I'm applying them to the HTML by further describing the HTML using the class attribute. All right, button. How buttons in this case a link is display inline by default. So, that's something I also want to kind of talk about. In general, I would prefer if links were display block because oftentimes they're going to wrap around other elements and in this and I but I want them to be display inline block here display inline block again I'm not expecting you to learn all this stuff from me explaining this to you I'm you've learned from the Odin project already right and now I'm just showing you some other ways to think about it we spend a month learning this stuff in uh, a perpetual education. You can't do it in one video. You can see the buttons going all the way across. There's a few ways to deal with that, but in this case, I'm just going to do a quick display inline block. Okay, so I've got my H1, my paragraph, and my button. Fine. Maybe I should open this in another window so I don't have to keep making it bigger and smaller. Wow. 
Wow, look how wide this is. That doesn't seem right. You know what we forgot to do is center and style our inner columns. One way to do that would be to say width, whatever you want it to be, maybe 100% or 98%, something, maybe give it a little space around the sides. And you could say max width of whatever, 900 pixels, margin right, auto, margin left, auto. This is going to confuse the computer and it's going to center it. How's this looking? That's looking pretty good, right? It's getting close. What else we got going on? Graphic diptych. I'm gonna say border, four pixel solid, Dodger blue. And I think all these things that say four pixels should be a little bigger because I want it to look like my mock-up enough that we can be on the same page here. Looking pretty good. Now, colors. Should we deal with some colors? Let's just make one at least. Okay, where would we put it? We got the reset. We got the setup. We got the structure. Got some typography. Got some components. I don't know where you'd put it. Some people would want to put it way at the top, but I'm not going to really, hmm, maybe. The key is I want to make some reusable variable type things, and I'm not going to use them. Where am I going to use them? I don't know. I guess I'll put them. I guess I'll put it all the way at the top. Now I'm going to put it underneath the setup here. Okay, I'm going to call this settings. Okay, now you'll see in a lot of blog posts this thing called root, but I'm not going to do that because you don't even know what root is. So I don't suggest you ever use things you don't understand. HTML is just fine. There's this new thing called custom properties. You can think about them as variables if you want. They're much more powerful and interesting than that. But I could just say color and then whatever, like blue, right? Let's make it something else. Let's say magenta. And then, now this is me defining this property. And then down here in the button, for example, I could say use this custom property as a variable. Now my text or my thing, my button is gonna take on that color. So I can have a brand wide color and in the case of this, there's sort of this blue that keeps showing up and I can have a light blue and a dark blue maybe. I also think it is good to just get some nice black and white in there. Black, maybe we'll have a slightly not so black black and white, similar type of situation. And we've got our main color then you could also choose something like dark, which could be navy, maybe that dark color, or you could have light, which seemed like there was a lighter blue. And it doesn't really matter what these are because we can change them all right at the last minute. But just getting them in place so we can think about them, especially on a project this small, you don't have to overthink it. Here are some things we can use. Typography, we can just leave the button the way it is. Um, let's put some font families in here. Font family sans serif. We don't have to get bogged down by font families and stuff. Cool, cool, cool. It's all coming together. It feels very abstract, but it's coming together. In this graphic diptych, in this text content, I could do a few things too. I could say that I want my paragraph to have some kind of margin top and you could play around with using M's. I'm just going to use some pixels in this case and I could do the same thing for the button. At this point there's no reason to that I need to use flex. But I kind of like using flex even when it's unnecessary here because I want to use this gap. So instead, if I move this up here and set up a gap, 
flex direction column. Well, that's going to put the, the immediate children, the text content, and the picture, which I could reorganize just for clarity. The picture comes first. Now I have that little gap to help me out. And then when it goes sideways, I have my gap the other way. I'm feeling pretty good about this diptych here. It looks just like the uh, mock-up. So now what? I could decide to try to get this section looking a little more serious or professional, or I could move on to another section. This video is getting pretty long, though. I, I was told by, um, by a bunch of YouTuber people that you shouldn't make long YouTube videos. Maybe I will have to wrap it up and put the rest of the video in a different one. I don't know. I heard people got scared off by long videos because all that free teaching and content and stuff is, oof, sounds scary. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here and I'm going to gut out some of these things for now. If I can comment those out. All right. Let's try to get a feel for what it's actually going to look like. Look at that. It wasn't very hard to make this responsive. I just had to make a little media breakpoint. So trying to bring it back from the dead after it's already uh, for the desktop only is a lot more work. This is like this dark color, the background. So I don't want to style the diptych because I might be using the diptych in many different places. Again, let's go over the setup here. We've got our setup, our reset, our setup. We've got some settings. We've got some dev styles that may be useful. Maybe we'll eventually just delete them got the structure, got some typography, got some components, got some modules. So it keeps getting a bigger and bigger scope in a way as we go down. Down here is where I want to start differentiating the sections themselves. So this is where I'm going to think of welcome. Welcome. This is a section and I can come up here and give it a class of, of welcome. So this is the welcome section. And it just so happens to have a graphic diptych inside of it. So the welcome would say background color var dark. Because remember, I made that like kind of like navy. And then I could say color var white. Because I don't want to tie the color to this reusable module type of thing. I just want to kind of lay some color over this section. Welcome. And in the welcome section, I could style the button to be special. I could say background color. Well, really, we should just change the color to be blue. This is where I might want to actually grab the color from the thing they gave us. For that, I'll use a little program called SIP. Okay, so that's a dark, dark color. You see what I'm doing here? I'm just adding some colors. I don't know why they're in RGB8 right now, but that's okay. Well, we've got a gray, that's good to know. I don't really see a light color anywhere. The things that make websites look professional are really a lot of neutral tones, varying degrees of grays and stuff, not just tons of color. Ah, I used the wrong one down here. Let's see, I used dark, so. Just because I copy and pasted it. Okay, now, where are we? I had to go eat dinner. I've been doing this what seems like all day now. I had to go eat dinner. I don't even know what we're up to. Let's see. Um, well, 
the colors are good. We got some big heading. We got some paragraph text. We got a button. But this is really tight all around here. It's, it's all tight up to the top. So it needs spacing around it. That's you know, it needs some negative space to let it breathe. I also I made this link as an example, but I don't really need a link in there. And it looks all weird in dark blue. So maybe I should at least change links to be the right color. Which again, maybe my settings need to be higher up. Put them way up here. Var color. At least it's readable now. Since we need to figure out our own mobile styles, well, let's just start there. Don't get freaked out. You can look at the graphic diptych and we could just, you know, maybe that's where the padding should be. What do you think? Sometimes you want it to be on the inner column. Sometimes you want it to be on the module. Padding, top, who knows what, 30 pixels, padding, bottom. 30 pixels. You'll have to decide based on your site and your needs. This looks a lot better, but it's still pretty tight. Another thing you could do besides padding with pixels is you could say, I don't know, 20 viewport height. Well, maybe that's a little too big. Now this is going to be dependent on the height of the page itself. See how it's changing. So that's something you could consider. And you could tidy up this button a little if you wanted. Another thing to think about is these little voice things I made. I might want my typography to change a little bit depending on the size of the screen. The size of the screen. So I can make a media query here too. I don't have to change all these other things because they're just going to carry over. But maybe the font size will just get a little bit bigger. This is feeling pretty good. But all of these sections have padding around them to give them space. So instead of putting them on the diptych, maybe I should put them on something else how about this inner column padding top 10 viewport height and you could do some kind of min max situation to make sure it didn't get out of hand but that's beyond the scope of being able to make it decent website like this but now look the header <laughs> the header has that inner column I don't really want that to happen up there or in the footer so you might have to get more specific and say that the header inner column doesn't have these types of padding you could also give these all a class of page section or something and you could hook into that that's another style you could do. But for our purposes, this is working just fine. This image gets pretty big. You could also put a max width on this picture. And give it a little more negative space. Just because you have the room doesn't mean you should use it. So on a phone, this looks pretty nice. It's a picture and some text, just like Instagram. And then when it gets a little bigger, I have this area with some nice negative space around it and give me a little bit of room to breathe. And then when it gets really big, it can take up the whole page like it is supposed to in this design. It took a little while to set everything up and get the reset in place and get all of the different code in here 
And if we were using PHP or, or some kind of other system, we might break all these up into different files. And this graphic diptych might just be, you know, I'd be able to copy and paste it into any of these. So let me just put it in here and put it in the quote. Like, bam. Now I have a dark one and a light one. All I had to do is just copy the module. And a lot of this CSS is going to be site-wide. It's all worked out already. And what it's going to come down to is a little chunk of CSS like this and a little chunk of HTML like this. And sometimes these can be abstracted off into their own little files. So these little tiny mini websites are what you just slot into the site-wide structure. With that in mind, I feel like we've talked about everything you would need to create the rest of this website for yourself. You just need to know a little bit about Flexbox and really how to organize these rules so that they can work for you and you're not like fighting the cascade. Instead, you can use the cascade, just like how we themed our welcome section down here so easily. If I come down to this section and say class about or something, I could style this however I want about background color salmon color white something like that now here's a different looking section I could put a background image on it I could put a gradient I could change the button colors by using modules and then hooking into them based on their section based on their context then you can create a system that is easy to work with so if you really want me to do the rest of the page well, I don't know, leave a comment or something and, and maybe I'll do it. But I think all of the things that are, are that we talked about in here are going to be the same. They're the same for the heading. The, there's just going to be some stuff up here on the left, stuff up here on the right. It's the same, same stuff. <laughs> Almost everything on all websites is just a heading and a button and maybe an image. And the same thing with all these products down here. I guess I could just mock out the products really, really fast here. So products, there is some kind of header. I guess we'll just call this thing like products, products grid. This can be a products grid module that will surely be used many places. And it kind of has its own little header. And that's something we can debate. Like, should there be a header in here? I don't know. I'm not going to get into it right now. But let's just say that there's a heading level two, our products. And then below there, you can decide based on your accessibility setup, if, if you want to have lists or just a big chunk of stuff. Uh, but in my case, I'll just put in an unordered list and not necessarily ordered. I could say class product list class product and then inside here I would just have a product card which is something I just made up right now the funny thing about the product card is it's exactly the same as this <laughs> it's exactly like this graphic diptych thing there's a name there's a product there's a little tiny sentence about it maybe not a paragraph and you know a button probably to click into it So there's our products. I'll just take loud voice, which is not the correct one necessarily in this case, but I'm going to put it up on here on this H2, just for an example of kind of plugging and playing. These would be maybe H3s. And there you have our little product card. So I can just dump these list items. I don't know how many there were, like four. Okay, and so uh, in my modules section, I'll just create my little product grid. And then I just happen to have this little snippet that I got from CSS Tricks, grid it, is what I called it. And that will just create a grid, a simple practical grid. You can go read about that. 
it's going to repeat the columns and it's going to try to autofill it with the minimum of uh, like a min max of try to be 300 pixels basically it's basically like a flex basis it's going to try to be 300 pixels so in this case products product list product grid oh okay I don't want just the product grid I want product grid product list class product list okay I feel like Product card is kind of a component to product card display block. I better tell it to be display block. Product product grid products grid. That's what I did wrong. Products grid is also a custom element, so I'll say display block. Okay, there we go. We got a grid. I could make some adjustments. I could say that this is you know, 240 pixels wide grid items. That's one way I can do it. I could also come up here and check my uh, structure and change the max width to something a little more modern, 1100 maybe. And there you go. You got some products in, an, in a grid. Once you get these pictures under control and you have your module set up, as you can see, it's pretty quick. Another thing you could do is do that, you know, the, the header is going to be sticky, top zero, the footer looked like it was darker. I think you can take it from here. But if I make a video doing the rest of it, I will link it in the description. So anyway, I hope that that's useful. I don't know, I, <laughs> I made this video throughout the day uh, and it just came out like this, not anywhere near as professional <laughs> as the normal videos we make for the school. I hope you're able to see that by understanding the different display types and how to keep a structure clean and organized and how to layer on the styles that you can make a very responsive website in a pretty quick amount of time and then you don't have to go relearn how to do web development later because you followed the wrong tutorials. If you're looking for a web design and web development education path that has taken painstaking <laughs> measures to take all of the books and all the things that you need to know about this journey and, and has put them in order of importance so that you can really get deep and learn this stuff, well, you know where to find us.